We welcome in Cam Robinson, Director of Content for Elite, Elite Prospects. Good afternoon. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, fellas. How are we doing? Yeah, Good. okay. Um, what did you make of the game last night? I mean, this team's hard to kill, right? They You can't really put them in the ground. Um, and they've showed that, you know, going back to last playoffs and last season, too. It's trailing by two, and they managed to steal a point in a game they probably didn't have any business getting a point out of. Um, you could thank Lankin in for a lot of that. He he probably he probably deserves a lot for that uh, that extra point. But I think I think that disallowed goal, that offside, and then Nakash, you know, scoring it, it kind of set the wheels off track a bit for them. But I mean, it's 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 Quinn, it's Spesser, it's Miller, kind of driving the bus offensively, and everybody else is struggling a little bit here. And and then on the blue line, it's all Quinn Hughes, and and then a lot of question marks. So it's still a work in progress, I'd say. There aren't any perfect games, though, are, are there? Like, it, it's um, it, there are two teams playing. I think both coaches are going to have quibbles. Uh, you know, the Canes let the Canucks back into it. Uh, is you know, could be Rod Brindamore's uh, you know point here. It's just kind of interesting to see how Rick Tockett reacts to each of these passing games because um, you know he was unequivocally uh, pleased with the effort versus the Pittsburgh Penguins in which they dug themselves a hole and climbed out of it. And uh, yet has said no 60-minute game there yet this year Yes, uh, on Saturday. And, and obviously that was the case uh, this last time out. I just wonder um, if this is going to be a, a season-long chase of the perfect game that you know, probably doesn't ever come. This is still a, a, you know, a, a flawed team here. It is, and and I think we talk about that every week. Is that there are holes in this roster, and and they are supported by some true star talent in some really important positions, and even in net right now, Lankinen is playing you know star level hockey a lot of the time too, and so he's cleaning up a lot of the mistakes they're making. Um, you know, on that Carolina end, you're absolutely right. Is that they they coughed up a two goal lead, but at the same time, you know, Lankinen made some big big stops on some high danger plays. Um, and then, you know, Kochetkov is, he's a wanderer, the opposite. that guy, right? He's, he's <laughs> yeah. a wanderer. Um, yeah. he, he's volatile and he's, he's a lot of fun in, but, but he can, you know, he made two blunders there that cost some goals and, and that's gonna, you know, that's kind of the difference in this one. He looked like a really good men's league goalie that like forgot about all of the basics of, <laughs> of tending goal. Uh, but Hey, I, 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 I want to thank him. He made it an entertaining yes, night. So, he yes, he uh, did. If that's how he plays on the regular, then wow, I need to watch more Carolina Hurricanes hockey. Um, let's get to Pedersen here, Cam. We're asking on our Surrey Mitsubishi poll question today, what will get him out of his slump? Should they reunite the lotto line, play him with Besser, bench him, leave him be? Well, feel free to go off the boards. Any ideas on how to get Pedersen going? I mean, playing him 11 minutes at five on five isn't going to do it, which is what he had last night. Um, but at the same time, like at some point, he's going to have to dig himself out of this, right? Like obviously he scored the goal the other night, which was huge, a five on five goal, breaking that God awful streak. So people can't tweet it anymore. Um, but, you know, I was watching you know, the way Besser and Miller, they have such great chemistry. Um, and Besser is he's, he's the last year and a half has been so excellent, but it's, it's got to hurt a little bit for Pedersen because they were kind of the connection, right? They were supposed to be the ones that were playing together for years and years, and he's lost that now. Um, so maybe it is, or, you know, reuniting the lotto line and really loading that up. It's going to hurt your depth a ton, um, but now you're going to have to rely on, on Garland and Hogland to really drive play on a second line potentially. Um, so it and DeBrusque, I guess, if he can get going, he's snake bit and he's still, you know, he's a streaky score, but um Honestly, I think it's between the ears with Pedersen, and he's going to have to do this himself. He's going to have to shoot the puck, right? Another game with one shot on goal. He's averaging one and a half on the season. Um, you know, last year he put two and a half on that, you know, a couple years ago when he dropped 39, he was averaging 3.2 shots a game. That's what you need to see from Pedersen. He needs to just start uncorking it from all over the ice, and I think that alone is going to start to get that monkey off his back, start to get some confidence going. Pucks are going to squeak in. He's going to get a snipe or something like that. We need that Pedersen back. That guy who walked down the the wall and clapped a, a big one timer, a slap shot over the Detroit goaltender from a few years ago. That's the Pedersen we need to see. Not trying to dipsy doodle and make the perfect play all the time. Not often you see Elias Pedersen at forty one point six seven in Corsi four percentage either. So even some of the fundamental stuff that we're used to seeing from Elias Pedersen away from the puck uh, wasn't necessarily there as well. 
Uh, not often he gets name checked by the coach after the game, although he did sort of hold Held himself back. back a little bit uh, just as he realized, oh, shoot, I'm about to throw the $12 million man under the bus. Um, but is he in the doghouse based on ice time that you mentioned and and deployment? Uh I mean, I think we're all intrigued by what assignment he's going to get for for the next game. Yeah, you know, I I, I really thought that that was interesting the way that you know talk it. He wasn't shy about ripping Huglander, right? He just said he yeah. hated it, hated his game, right? And then he started to say the same about Pedersen, and he held off. And I think that that's really telling on how they're trying to deal with him, right? He isn't necessarily a tough love responder. Um, and, you know, so the whole scrum with JT Miller and all that is that like, is this really going to be the thing that motivates him? I have no problem with a couple of teammates getting into it in practice. I, I like to see a little fire. Um, but, you know, it is it is showing that, you know, Pedersen really thrived under Bruce Boudreau, who's, you know, kind of that nurturing, boost you up type of coach. Um, talk it, and, you know, a bit of a hybrid, but probably more on the firm side of things, but not, you know, to hold back and to not say what he wanted to say there, I think is really, it speaks uh, a lot to how they're trying to, to motivate him and bring him up and do whatever they can. Um, and now, you know, they brought it up Baines. He replaced Hoglander on that line for stretches. Um, you know, do we see a complete blender? I, I think that they're probably waiting for a loss before they kind of really threw the lines up. And uh, and so we'll see what kind of mixes and matches they do. But yeah, I mean, I'd be tempted to throw DeBrusque down there too to maybe give him and him and PD another go. Um, get a look at that because DeBrusque isn't scoring either. So why not give them a look together? That was my next question, Kim. Where are you on DeBrusque? Uh, he's been a streaky guy in the past. Eight games here without a goal. Where are you on DeBrusque? You got to get one right, and that's gonna he's gonna he's gonna want to chuck that monkey off the back as soon as he can bear one. He's got you know he's got a handful of assists too, so it's not all uh, doom and gloom. And and you know the Corsi numbers are strong, but it's you know a big part of that is he's out there with Besser and Miller, and it's the team's top line, and they drive all the offense. And he's getting lots of minutes with with Hughes too. So um, he's getting he's getting paid, and he's he's getting paid to score goals. So I actually thought this would be the year he pushed for thirty. Uh, he better get one here soon if he's going to even have a sniff at that. Defensively, uh, both in a, and I mean that from a forwards playing defensively to a an actual defenseman playing defensively. Um, what what are you seeing there, and is there growth that is possible there, given the personnel that the Vancouver Canucks have? I mean, Brandstrom has been uh, I won't say a revelation, but he you know he's he's helped he's helped a lot um, in that bottom four. Um, you know, he didn't give up a high danger chance against while he was on the ice last night, and I think the Canucks had five four, so you know that's excellent. Um, but basically, you know, if Hughes isn't on the ice, the team's getting cratered on shots against, right? Like even Heronic, the second he's out there without Hughes, it's not looking good. Um, so Brandstrom is a help. Uh, but he's not a reliable piece in a top four. You can't be like, this is a guy we're going to run out there as our three or our four. It's just not not on a playoff team anyways. Um, so it's, I don't know if Susie's injured. He doesn't look nearly the player he was last year. And then their replacement pit bits just haven't really stepped up and played above replacement level and, and even below that at times too. So it, it's, it's a cause for concern at this point. Okay, um, there are some names out there on defense. Chris Johnson mentioned them last week in the Athletic or on the Athletic in a column. Uh, how do you feel about Pro? We've talked about Lil Jagrin uh, before. How do you feel about Provorov, Cam? He he's a he would be an upgrade for sure. You know, um, he's a physical player. He can move the puck. He can skate. Um, the offense isn't what it once looked like it could have been when he was drafted so high by the Flyers all those years ago. I was a huge fan of his when he was a junior player. The, you know, he, this was one of these guys who threw like five shots on goal per game when he was in junior too. Um, but. Uh, you know, the thing with him is that he's he's a bit of a headache in the room and there's a reason that he's on the market and there's a reason that he has been moved already. And so, you know, you, you got to have to weigh that in a little bit is that what kind of ripples would that bring into the dressing room? But I think it's a strong leadership group. It's a strong coaching staff. If the price is right. Yeah, it's an upgrade that you could definitely look at doing, right? What's he, four and a half mil on the cap? It's not. Yeah, he's four, seven, two, five, uh, and he's yeah. a UFA. Let me throw two other names that were on that list to you. Uh, Cam Fowler in Anaheim. Cam Fowler's a player, right? Like he's, he's, he, that would definitely be an upgrade. Um, he makes a lot more money and, uh, but he can play a ton of minutes. He can play in any role you want for him. Absolutely. And, and everybody in their dog knows that he wants out of Anaheim, right? Like that's just how it's going to be. They have to move him. Um, but he's not going to be cheap to get out of there either. Yeah. And with term left as well at 6.5 million. I lied. Pedersen, uh, Marcus Pedersen in Pittsburgh wasn't on the list, but he's apparently available as well. What do you think of him? Why not another Pedersen? Hey, just, just have oh them all. Just, just accrue all the Pedersons, right? 
again, uh, not a massive upgrade, but a player that you can slide into your middle four and he can play, you know, 18 minutes a night and move the puck effectively and, and you know, kind of kind of stop the rush okay too. Uh, again, the price is right on that one. Him and Lil Jagrin are a similar camp in my mind. He's probably better than Lil Jagrin though. Cody Cece apparently available in San Jose as well. Oh, thank you. No, no, that's a hard pass you. there. Yeah, no. No, thank yeah. you. Power play. What would you do on this uh, with this first unit power play? Get some more dynamic movement with the puck. Get them wheeling around. Kind of get them all to copy Quinn Hughes a little bit here and shoot the puck. Right? Like let's let's shoot the puck. Get it. Get it moving. And then one timers drive the crease. Get some dirty goals. Um, that's usually how you get a power play going is by getting a couple dirty ones. Right. So um, if you need to work low to high and then right back down low and go for stuff plays and jam plays. Um, just, just kind of stop being so fancy with it, and and just start shooting the puck and getting into the net front. And and you have the you have the personnel to do that. You have the guys that can go bar down from distance too, but you don't need to do that every time. The puck is a grenade for them on the power play. Only Quinn Hughes seems to be able to calm the puck and calm himself enough to actually have control of the puck. Everybody else seems awfully elevated as soon as the man advantage begins. It's like they're super excited trying to make a difference, and, but they can't possess the puck, for heaven's sake. So l- let me ask this then, because uh, Cam's a good ex as a nose case. Uh, we, we know that power plays used to be built uh, uh, around the defenseman with the big one-timer, uh, mm-hmm. McInnes and others. Could you build a power play around a defenseman pinching off the point and walking down to try and create an angled shot? Is that just Looney Tunes, or is there any way that you could make that your number one option? An angled on shot the, on the power play. I mean, you absolutely can, right? You put them on the weak side, and then you have to have someone who can actually handle the puck and draw that coverage over, which should be Pedersen, right? That that should be Pedersen over there, being able to bring everybody over, slide them over, get that kind of a pass down low. He pops a little bit out into the middle, gets a pass back that draws all the coverage to him. Maybe a little back pass over to that weak side defender who comes down and that's that's Quinn walking down with a lane, right? And you still got your net front guy. You still got that. If he wants to get, now everything's going to him. The goal is going to rush out hard. He can slip it right back over to Pedersen for a nice open net too if, if that play develops or he can just let it fly. Um, so absolutely you can. Um, it gets, that's, that's where you get a little fancy though, right? That's getting fancy with the power play too. And that's relying on people handling the puck and executing. So yes, if, if everything's free flowing and moving and everybody's looking good out there, absolutely. Those are the type of plays you can run. But right now I think you just keep it simple. Are, are they trying to still do the JT Miller skating downhill shot, which I love, but I, I, I don't see it. Are, are, are they gone away from that preemptively or do you think they're trying to get it off, but other teams are just checkmating them on that? obviously that it's a game plan against right because it is mm-hmm. so effective and Miller coming down lifting that one leg and he can go post it in and he can find his spot and and he is a true weapon out there and they know that they don't really have to worry about a massive one-timer from from a cross ice pass um, so they can kind of hedge a little bit down there and, and probably everybody in their dog knows that Pedersen's fighting it too and so they can sit off him a little bit too um, so until you get guys the threats all over the ice even that pop-out bumper play that was so effective for them for a couple of years too, right? We're not seeing that as much as well, is that until you can have multiple threats on that power play, teams can key in on one guy, it's Hughes, and even though he can beat him with his feet, um, it's still not opening up enough space for him to move it and, and have a really great A scoring chance. I mean, I, you almost wonder if just teeing up Pedersen and saying, you know what, even if it goes into shin pads, just establish the fact that you're willing to shoot so that teams now feel the need to mark you a little bit tighter and take the pressure off of, of Hughes and Miller. But he just doesn't take the shot, and so the teams don't bother with him over there. Exactly. I mean, how long has Ovechkin been in the league standing there? And yes. every single person in the rink knows what he's going to do, and it doesn't matter. Like, even if he gets eight blocked in a, in a game, he's still going to be firing eight more, and they're going to be hitting the net, or they're going to be coming close. Just tee off on him, because he has the big shot, right? He has the 100-plus mile-an-hour shot. He's your guy that needs to be doing that. So, yeah, absolutely, I think so. And, and yeah, you know, you don't want to give up a right into the shin pads and a breakaway down the other end. But if it happens, I guess it happens, right? Cross the bridge last, when we get to it. Exactly, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Last question for me uh, in an effort to uh, once per week get you a prospect to talk about. But Tom Wielander, Hockey East Defender of the Week at Boston University. How's he tracking down there? 
He's looking good. He's looking good. Points in all five this season. Um, scored the game winner the other night. He's playing a ton of minutes. Like I think he played like 25 minutes the other night. He's, he's playing 22 plus in, uh, on average on the season. Um, you know, he plays on their second power play. He plays on their top penalty killing unit. Loads of time at even strength. Um, what I've been looking for this season from him is that, is he handling the puck better? Um, is he making outlets clean? Um, and he is doing that. He still will bomb uh, an outlet, you know, four feet away from his, his intended passer every now and again, but he's, he's handling the puck under pressure a lot better. And that's going to be massive for him. I think it's going to be a really strong season for him at BU and then the world juniors, he'll, you know, he'll have a letter. Um, he'll be pushing a, to be a top player there for Sweden on the blue line. And then, and then probably come out at the end of the season. So this is a monster year for him and it's off to a really nice start. Was there any worry for you that Cole Hudson was going to steal minutes from him? Uh, no, uh, I mean, power play minutes. Sure. But, uh, but that's, that's what Cole Hudson does. He plays on a top power play unit, but he doesn't do much else. And so Vlander isn't going to be a top power play guy in the NHL, um, right. but he's, he's going to do everything else. So no, there was no concern there. It's it, as far as I'm concerned, it's a massive skill gap between those two players. Ah, okay. Awesome stuff. Cam, thank you for this, sir. We'll catch up next Tuesday. Talk then.